All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our next installment in our Health Talks Online. Uh, today, we're gonna to be talking a bit about the power of melatonin. Now, why do I say this and why do I have it here? And that's because we've been talking a lot about how stress, mood, and cycles really affect our sleep. And I really thought that we're gonna have this talk near the end where we're gonna talk about, we've, where we've talked about um, what we can do for stress, what we can do for calibrating our cycles. I want to get into the nitty gritty today about really understanding what melatonin does. And so just to start things off and just to, Let's see if I can get it here. Just a little disclaimer that this is not meant to treat or diagnose anyone in any way. Um, please do refer to your healthcare practitioner, whether that be your um, general practitioner, family doctor, nurse practitioner, or naturopathic physician. Um, at this time, we do have a lot of ideas and things coming up with the pandemic this presentation is not meant to suggest a cure or treatment for that. The intent of this presentation is just to inform and to educate. So just to, to start off with a bit about myself, my name is Dr. Romy Fung, and I'm a practicing naturopathic physician here in Richmond, British Columbia. Uh, I did my naturopathic medical training at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine. And prior to that, did my pre-medical training in health sciences at Simon Fraser. And at this point, I am finishing up my master's in aging and have also, as I love to say this with excitement, have been accepted to pursue a doctorate training. So that's a PhD training, also in aging and health starting in September. So I will be doing more hopefully in the study, in the studies and realm of Alzheimer's disease and dementia and I'm very excited to be sharing that with all of you today. Um, but as a naturopathic physician, I really look into what the root cause is. And my fascination in health is not just to treat my patients, but to also educate them in really having them understand why these things happen in the body. And this presentation is probably one of those key things that I'm excited to be sharing about because it, just, it doesn't really teach us what we do <clears throat> or what to do, but rather why we do it. And by having more reason, it kind of gives us more motivation to really start undertaking such simple yet powerful lifestyle cues and habits. So... I'm hoping that with today, we get a better understanding about what melatonin really does. And that hopefully gets you a better motivation to figure out ways to um, improve your sleep with maybe some consultation from the previous talks. <coughs> Sorry, give me a minute here. My body is still waking up, so I'm probably still high in the melatonin. <laughs> so why don't we get started here? First off, let's ask ourselves, what is melatonin and where is it made? First off, you're probably thinking, well, melatonin is a sleep hormone and that it's made in something called the pineal gland. So let's meet our friend the pineal. The pineal gland is the part of the brain that really resides deep in the center and it's very very small. Uh, in some literature it says the, the size and shape of a kernel of a corn and in other literature like a pea. It's such a small piece of gland and yet it has a very powerful role in our body. <clears throat> and one interesting thing I found is that the pineal gland is the first gland to be formed in your body as the baby develops. And you can actually distinguish this 
within th like with three weeks after conception. I thought that was quite interesting. But it's this gland that really ramps up the uh, production of melatonin. But if you were in my previous talks, um, especially I believe it was two weeks ago now on mood and sleep, we know that melatonin is made from something else. Does anyone know what that is? Leave it in the chat and I'm gonna get back to you on that. I'll give you 10 seconds just to say what it actually comes from. And for anyone who does, I'm gonna give you a pat on your back once this COVID-19 restrictions alleviate. Well, <clears throat> melatonin is made from serotonin. And serotonin is our feel-good hormone. So, the big question is, what does melatonin do? I mean, I thought it only just, you know, regulates our sleep and that the more melatonin made will actually get us to become sleepy and really help us to stay asleep during the night. And that melatonin works inside with sunlight, where if our body is exposed to sunlight, especially the retina of our eyes, you know, when the sun hits our eyes, it hits something called um, melopsin. And melopsin, once stimulated by sunlight, sends a signal to the brain, to the pineal gland, to then really ramp up the production of melatonin. But then the next question is, if melatonin helps us sleep, what does melatonin do while we're sleeping? And why do we sleep in the first place? This is where we have to dig into what happens during sleep and what kind of benefits come with sleep and control that without sleep. So in this presentation, then, we're going to go through a bit of literature, some fairly old, some more recent, some to do with animal testing, and some to do with human-controlled studies. So it's with these kind of studies that really give us an idea of what's happening in the body and gives us more of kind of like that big picture of what sleep is and why we really need to emphasize sleep, especially at times like this. So <clears throat> in terms of what melatonin does do, or what melatonin does, uh, we're gonna go through three big components here. There's actually a lot more, but given time, we're gonna go through some big ones and maybe we'll do a second part on the other components of melatonin. But first, it's a very potent antioxidant. Now, you've probably heard of antioxidants such as vitamin C. And that is true that vitamin C is an antioxidant. But because this is an antioxidant that we produce ourselves, we ought to be relying on this a lot more. And if our sleep is not optimal, chances are our body's antioxidant uh, production and antioxidant capability is not as optimal either. And what happens down the road? We're going to talk a bit more about that. It supports the immune system. There's a lot of receptors in the immune system that requires melatonin. And we're going to discuss a tiny bit about that. And for the big one here, a lot of evidence shows that those who really do lack sleep have a higher risk for cardiovascular disease. And they're finding the evidence that melatonin also supports maintaining a healthy heart. So let's get on with the first one, and that is melatonin as an antioxidant. Now, as you're listening to me and really getting into this talk, melatonin is still in the blood. If not, melatonin is high in the blood during sleep. And at this point, this is preventing the oxidation of LDL cholesterol. And that's the bad cholesterol that can clog up your arteries. 
Melatonin can also be in the brain, which is safeguarding irreplaceable neurons from free radical attack. There will be melatonin that can go into the fluid of the eyes and within your eyes to help prevent damage, which then, if damage occurs, that would aggregate the proteins in your eyes, forming cataracts. Melatonin in the lining of your gut in reducing your risk of ulcers. Every cell in your body is vulnerable to the attack of free radicals. And every cell in the body is protected by melatonin. So there's this theory of aging called free radical damage theory, where it poses in the molecular level um, a view of disease and aging, where more damage coming from free radical damage can lead to the premature, uh, premature death of the cell leading to aging. So in order to really understand what that concept is, we have to really get into the nitty gritty here. So first off, we all heard of what antioxidants are because we probably are taking you know, vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin E. But what does an antioxidant do? We have to then understand what oxidative stress oxidants are. So this might bring back some memories of chemistry, 10 chemistry, 12 or high school chemistry. But um, when you have any atom in chemistry, you have to pair the most outer shell of the atom with a pair of electrons. And it's with every paired electron that gives that atom the stability. But what happens when that electron is not paired? Well, that's what we call a free radical, and then it's very unstable. And when things get unstable in the atomic level, like let's say here that this atom is not paired, then what happens is this other uh, atom, <laughs> electron is not paired, then it's this other electron then wants to grab onto any other electron that it can access. And when it binds to that electron from a different atom, it's going to cause an exchange and it's going to cause damage. And that is the theory of aging in the cellular level. So what happens is that with antioxidants, by consuming and producing more antioxidants, antioxidants can actually quench this unpaired electron and donate its own electron to then neutralize this free radical. So the idea here is we eat vitamin C, fruits and vegetables, vitamin A, vitamin E, to simply try to quench these free radicals so that it prevents any damage from happening. Then you're going to probably ask me, where are these free radicals coming from? Why do they come in our body? Why is it happening? <clears throat> Unfortunately, free radicals is actually a byproduct. And we produce a lot of free radicals in our body. Many of these free radicals come as a consequence of, of breathing oxygen. And it's oxygen that's vital for our survival. <clears throat> but it's converting that oxygen to what we need, what we call cellular respiration. That then produces these byproducts called free radicals. Also, sorry, I'm just feeling a little gaggy here. It's this morning here. <laughs> <sighs> also, we have immune cells, and it's immune cells that, sorry, give me a moment.
My body is not waking up. So immune cells generate molecules to kind of equip themselves as with, with weapons to fight against viruses, bacteria, and even cancer. And during this kind of invasion, our immune cells then produce a lot of free radicals in which may injure both the viruses and the bacteria, but also can injure healthy cells. We also get exposed to free radicals in the form of radiation. So radiation such as UV light, ozone, tobacco, alcohol, smoke, asbestos, pesticides and herbicides, solvents and radiation. So we are exposed to a lot of things, but at the same time, think about the whole time we've been living on Earth. Our bodies have been producing melatonin since birth to be able to, and many other things too. It's not just melatonin that protects us, but we're talking specifically about melatonin in regards to you know, our sleep and optimizing our sleep. It's a level of protection that we have to safeguard us from a lot of other things happening. So in other words, we should actually be giving our bodies a pat on the back for actually doing this 24 seven. Now, how do we know that melatonin actually helps with this free radical damage as an antioxidant? This is where studies come in. So the first study uh, is a rat study. And what they did, or what the researchers did, is they took three groups of rats and then they injected something called saffron, which is a very powerful free radical. In other words, by injecting saffron, you're going to get a lot of damage. And from the law of damage, they can measure how much damage in the form of toxins um, by collecting through blood. So they made three groups. One is having the toxin, the saffron alone. The other is having saffron with a lower dose of melatonin, and then saffron with a higher dose of melatonin. And then they would let them, uh, I think it was, they would measure it within 24 hours. And then they measured the liver cells for any form of DNA damage. And they found that the least amount of DNA damage happened with the higher levels of melatonin, which tells us that DNA was actually pr uh, protected. So that's one suggestion that melatonin actually protects us from free radical damage. And free radicals, as I uh, pointed out with the, um, the antioxidant, it doesn't have to be just coming from our physical cells. It can also damage DNA. And that is the basis of, of cancer. There was another study also done in rats in 1993 when it, uh, when it comes to the eyes. So the theory here is that when protein becomes damaged, it coagulates. And we know that the lens of the eyes, of our eyes, of majority of eyes, is about 98% protein. So if it coagulates because it gets damaged, it becomes opaque. And that results in cataracts. It's like very similar to what happens when you fry an egg or an egg white. The clear egg white then becomes opaque. That's kind of the basis of what happens with cataracts in our eyes. So in 1993, uh, a researcher, Dr. Abe, um, first took the rat and depleted the rat of glutathione. Now, glutathione is also another antioxidant, just like melatonin, but it's also a key master antioxidant. So if melatonin is not working, glutathione would likely come in to support. So in order to make sure that we, had, uh, that we got rid of any confounding factors, the researchers had to deplete the rats of um, glutathione. <clears throat> A rat that is made glutathione deficient 
and also melatonin deficient developed cataracts in as little as two weeks. So that's just 14 days. Half of these rats were given melatonin to see if they were prevented from forming. And rats given melatonin, despite the fact that they were depleted from glutathione, 16 days later, all rats that were um, given melatonin didn't actually develop cataracts. The one rat did develop one cataract, and that was only in one eye. So it's not as powerful as glutathione, but so much powerful enough that, you, uh, that it's preventing these cataracts from forming in rats. So with the eye, same thing, the brain is also vulnerable to free radical attack. Um, the brain is, you know, about 70% fat. And fats are very vulnerable to actual damage. Just like the fat that is in your blood, when it's damaged, it forms something called um, your blood clot, or your, um, um, we call it atherosclerosis. So that's pretty much the clogging of the arteries. But we talked about how uh, free radical damage, oxidants come as a byproduct from um, breathing oxygen and utilizing oxygen. Well, the brain may only be 2% of our body weight, but it consumes about 20 to 30% of the oxygen we inhale. So this small organ is taking up as, met, as much as one third of our oxygen consumption. And that leads to a lot more byproduct production. So of course, the brain is going to be very susceptible. That leads to a very steady stream of free radical damage. So the body also has its own protective mechanism for the brain, and that's the blood-brain barrier. Most things don't really cross it, but free radical damage, yes. But there's also a lot of evidence that melatonin can cross it. And it's melatonin that really needs to be present to protect the brain. And thus, we see a lot of you know, brain cognition deficits and brain conditions, especially those who are lacking sleep. And that's one point about it. So we talked a bit about how melatonin, when produced properly, can really protect our bodies from such damage. Our next point now is immune support. Has anyone ever had that time in their life where they deprive themselves from sleep, whether that be from work, school, having a child, raising a child, and then you're more susceptible to really catching a cold after. Think about that for yourself. In probably most cases, yes. We know that melatonin is directly linked with our immune system. And there was a, a study done in regards to, um, I believe it was college students um, that was given 20 milligrams of melatonin. Now, I don't know why someone would give someone 20 milligrams of melatonin. That's pretty much extremely high. Um, but they separated the, um, the subjects, the college students, into two groups, one with 20 milligrams of melatonin and the other without, or a, a placebo. And then they alternate two weeks later. Those who had melatonin compared to the other group with a placebo produced 250% more salivary immunoglobulin A, IgA. And that tells us that our immune system is functioning. So this is, IgA is a main class of antibodies that is present in our saliva, mucus, tears, respiration, and also our gut. It's kind of like our first level of defense. And for that to be increased with melatonin, that means that our immune system is then linked at one point 
with the production and utilization of melatonin. So there are receptors found in a lot of assays where T helper cells, so these are immune cells that have an attachment point for, for melatonin. And then once the melatonin attaches to it, a cascade of events uh, leads to creating signals for then the immune, uh, immune system to then function. So think about the next time you consider doing an all-nighter or that you're sacrificing your sleep for, um, I'm telling this to myself for my paper or my dissertation, or the next time you do a Netflix binge, Instagram in bed, give this a thought. Lastly, cardiovascular support. So we talked, uh, we brought up that it can protect the heart. But did you know that the cardiovascular system and the heart has a distinct daily cycle? We think of our sleep as a cycle. Have you ever considered, you know, your heart as a cycle, your digestion as a cycle? And it's all going based on a specific time and that maybe you've you've probably had the, um, the experience or the feeling when you flew into a different country and passed several time zones that something wasn't going right, specifically maybe, well, first off with our sleep, you might be jet lagged, but what about your digestion? Have you ever thought about it or even thought about, hmm, every time I travel, I seem to feel something different going on with my digestion and I can't really pinpoint what it is. Potentially, it could be that your gut's cycle is actually out of tune. But talking about the cardiovascular, during nighttime, our hearts beat more slowly and our blood pressure drops and the amount of cholesterol in the bloodstream also declines. So everything is actually just almost, not everything, but it starts to empty out and even calcium is emptied because there are a lot of cells that carry excess calcium. And it's that time at the night when the body starts wanting to clean that. And then as day breaks, when you have the sun, the heart starts picking its pace back up. Your blood pressure then rises and then your level of calcium in the cells build up. Has anyone ever tried taking their blood pressure in the morning and then also right before bed and find that there's actually quite a significant difference? Well, they're working with the cardiovascular cycle. But by increasing the pace, the blood pressure and the calcium as day breaks and when the sun rises, these changes really help us gear up for the challenges in the day. But also, as it's gearing up, it also puts us a bit at risk, especially if we're already at risk to begin with for heart attack and stroke, especially as we age. So it's interesting to note that maybe you might have that experience or your friends, or even you read this in um, research, but there are statistics that show that we are most vulnerable to a cardiac emergency. So most majority of people tend to experience like a heart attack or even stroke between the hours of 6 a.m. and noon, with greatest risk occurring at about 9 a.m. Some cardiovascular specialists even refers to these hours as the heart attack zone. And that's because with the day coming up and the body's knowing that day is breaking, it starts to ramp up the blood pressure and the rate. And that, depending on where your baseline is, could put you at risk. It's kind of interesting to, to take note of that and to really, to really see that. Because as you can see with the chart right here, with the graph right here, as we wake up at around eight or nine, our melatonin goes down our, and our core temperature goes up, meaning our um, our metabolism then goes up and everything starts to ramp up from there too. So our hearts likely have their own cycle. 
So what is it about melatonin that then helps with our cardiovascular system? Um, though not shown, but this study here in 1994 has mentioned the relationship between LDL receptor activity, so the LDL bad cholesterol, and melatonin. And they suspect a relationship between high levels of bad cholesterol and low melatonin. So we've known this for you know, more than 20 years and maybe even further in, uh, beyond, but we never really thought about it. But looking at this rat study right here, first off, um, the rats were treated with increasing doses of certain drugs such as lopinavir and ritinavir. And that gives the rat higher concentrations of total cholesterol, LDL, and HDL, so the good and the bad. But looking just at the bad cholesterol and total cholesterol, they then gave the rats melatonin. All these in, uh, increases in, these, uh, in the cholesterol total and LDL were then significantly reduced by melatonin. And then even more so when linked or uh, paired with lipoic acid. So this implies that maybe melatonin has something to do with, um, with maintaining our cholesterol levels and thus maintaining our risk of cardiovascular disease. But this was probably one, one thing to think about in really understanding and thinking of future studies down the road. But one of the ideas here is that maybe it protects the heart from um, lowering levels of cholesterol, but maybe it's also because it has that antioxidant protection that we talked about too. Because if we have a lot of LDL cholesterol, and we think of LDL cholesterol as you know the bad cholesterol, and it's not necessarily bad, it's just that LDL cholesterol has a very higher risk of being damaged by oxidative stress. So even if you reduce the LDL that a lot of doctors, including myself, tend to do, yes, that reduces the risk of um, producing the plaques. But if you're only reducing what is susceptible to damage and not reducing the damage itself, well, you're not really getting at it from a full picture. But when LDL gets damaged, it then wants to bind onto the blood vessel wall. And that's how a plaque really starts. So do you actually want to reduce the LDL? Or, or should I say and, do you also want to reduce the oxidative stress, the oxidative damage? You'd, ideally, you'd want to do both. But looking at it from this standpoint, the LDL has been not only reduced, but the risk, uh, but the damage onto LDL was also reduced, likely due to the fact that melatonin acts as an antioxidant. So some human studies that I thought was very interesting. Um, there was one done in 1995 where they took people and they compared their melatonin levels with any history of coronary heart disease based on their lipid levels and cholesterol. And they found that those who were healthy and did not have any existing um, cardiovascular disease was producing five times, up to five times more melatonin than those living with cardiovascular disease or a history, having a history of heart attack, et cetera. And so I found that to be quite interesting. And this is also um, mentioned that one of the things that we have to consider is also their age. So we can't really get, you know, 30, 40 people, maybe more, um, or a lot of people who are in their 20s with a heart disease. So that's quite challenging as it is. 
but to gather a group of people within you know the 30s 40s and 50s that may have some pre-existing condition uh, or predisposed cardiovascular disease they found that those that were healthy were producing five times as much melatonin so is it that having a condition can also affect the production of melatonin we're not pretty sure but even another study earlier on in 1988 um, showed that in um, the older adult people with severe hypertension had half the nighttime melatonin levels of people with moderate hypertension so it's giving us this chicken or the egg kind of situation but of course these studies may give me and may give you some idea but there's also other things we had to think about for example for this study right here people with hypertension and more severe hypertension had half the nighttime melatonin levels but were they taking anything else or were they doing anything that could actually prevent the body from producing melatonin could it be that you know these people with severe hypertension were leading um, you know fortuna 500 companies and they're constantly stressed and if they're constantly stressed they're ramping up their blood pressure and they're probably taking away their sleep time that could be one underlying thing another underlying thing could be that the use of certain medications can actually reduce your production of melatonin one big group of medication are the beta blockers that control blood pressure so any medication that has the um, lol ending not that we're laughing out loud but um, can actually affect our body's own capability of producing melatonin and there was another study that showed that it's melatonin that can also help with blood pressure too things to consider here uh, there was a rat study done in 1991 that by injecting the rat with uh, melatonin it relaxes the smooth lining of the aorta so we're, we're seeing a conundrum of effects, like a snowball effect, because if you're not sleeping well, for example, let, let's start off with not sleeping well, because I guess we could put me as the, the subject here, because I'm not spending much time sleeping, because I'm either studying too much or reading too much research or doing too much research. But this fellow who's doing too much research is then skimping out on sleep. And by skimming out on sleep, I'm going to get to a point where I'm going to get even more stressed. And we know from our previous talk that the less, uh, the less sleep you have, your body's going to be even more stressed and producing more of that, um, uh, that um, stress hormone, cortisol. And it's cortisol that then helps us get us out of whatever threat is happening so that can include increasing our heart rate and include increasing our blood pressure and if our blood pressure then is increased and likely our heart rate well they're likely going to go see a doctor and then they're going to say well your blood pressure is increased take this medication your blood pressure then normalizes but then it's also going to reduce your production of melatonin and what happens when we reduce our production of melatonin? Our sleep's gonna get worse. And if our sleep's gonna get worse, we're just gonna get more stressed. You see where I'm getting at here? Though it's not gonna be that basic, but that's how we really need to figure out where we need to break the cycle and where we need to start introducing our lifestyle interventions first and foremost. So to summarize this, this was probably a very scientific heavy talk for this past month. And I hope you see the beauty as to why we utilize these kind of studies in the first place. But our bodies produce melatonin for a reason. And then there's growing evidence 
that melatonin production then supports our body's functioning. And it's that it's during sleep that really helps us kind of optimize the health of the body. But rather than supplementing, think about what we talked about today. And for those of you that have or have not went through my previous talks, those talks are actually posted online in YouTube. And I'll tell you a bit afterwards. But we talk about other aspects of sleep and even tips to, to help with that sleep on, based on that component of um, sleep. But I think maybe later on, um, as majority of us agreed prior to this talk, that we're going to have a future talk likely in two, maybe three weeks in this month of May to have one talk completely all about tips on how to improve your sleep. So let's um, abide by that rather than supplementing that we try supporting the body in its own production. So that concludes my talk for today. Uh, just to let you know again that our talk next week and starting next week, uh, we're going to have all our talks on a Tuesday rather than a Monday at 10 in the morning. And this next talk, we're going to be talking about how we can fix our gut to fix our sleep. Because there is a big link between the gut health and the brain, the gut-brain axis. Not only does that affect our mood, but it also, now we know, our mood can also affect our sleep and vice versa. So we're going to be talking about that. And we're also going to be talking about foods that can really dramatically impact the quality of sleep. Um, if you really liked this talk, uh, I ask that you give my Facebook page a like. Follow me on Instagram. Um, I do post a lot of health tips and also um, notifications and news on upcoming talks. Uh, I tend to do a lot of talks in the city of Richmond live in person, and that would be typically announced on my Facebook page. And you'd be up to date with any of the future talks, hopefully with COVID-19 alleviating um, soon. But we are planning on um, quite a few talks happening uh, likely in the fall. And if the fall live talks are not going to happen because our restrictions are still in place, then we're going to have all of those talks live, but on Zoom. Um, so that for people who have, li uh, have liked my Facebook, they will be informed on how to, uh, how to approach that. Um, but if you have any other questions or any questions about what we talked about, um, I invite you to post them on the chat box at this point, and I'll be more than happy to answer them. I'm going to be stopping the recording right now so that we don't identify anyone. Thank you so much for having me here, and let's see if we have any questions.